SpaceX and its ambitious Starship lander are taking most of the heat right now for delays to NASA's Artemis program. Don't get me wrong, SpaceX is making incredible progress on an insanely difficult project, and they already seem to be going full throttle. It's not like everything else in the Artemis program is running perfectly, while SpaceX is the only one holding things up. Still, it makes you wonder, what more could SpaceX realistically do to speed up Starship's development? And if that's not possible, are there any alternative paths that could help them deliver on time for such a demanding mission? If you haven't been keeping up lately, NASA is looking for new ideas for lunar landers to help astronauts return to the moon. Progress on SpaceX's Starship Mega Rocket, originally chosen for the job, has been slower than expected. During an interview on Monday morning, U.S. Transportation Secretary and Interim NASA Administrator Sean Duffy announced NASA will reopen the contract to build the Human Landing System, HLS, for the Artemis III mission, which aims to put American astronauts back on the moon for the first time since the Apollo era. The contract was initially awarded to SpaceX, which Duffy praised as an amazing company. However, he voiced concern that the Starship HLS may not be ready in time, suggesting that Blue Origin or another competitor could take over. The problem is, they're behind, Duffy said. They've pushed their timelines out, and we're in a race against China. The president and I want to get to the moon within this presidential term. Not surprisingly, Elon Musk didn't take the comments well, firing back on X by calling the interim NASA administrator Sean Dangerously Stupid Dummy. Politics aside, if you look at where the Starship program stands today, it's not hard to see why Duffy might have his doubts. Since its debut in 2023, SpaceX's massive Starship rocket has flown 11 times with mixed results. Some flights ended in rapid unscheduled disassemblies, SpaceX's trademark term for explosions. But there have also been big wins, like the first successful landing of the Super Heavy booster back at Starbase, a key step toward full reusability. While SpaceX has landed Starship prototypes before, it hasn't yet yet landed a full two-stage system. That's the next major goal, proving both stages can be quickly reused, central to SpaceX's plan for high-frequency, low-cost missions. Starship's upper stage has splashed down in the ocean during test flights, helping refine re-entry and descent systems. The ultimate aim, though, is to bring it home to Starbase, caught mid-air by the Mechazilla Tower arms. Elon Musk says that the first on-site landing could happen as early as 2026. Starship hasn't yet achieved full orbital insertion, a must for Moon and Mars missions. To reach orbit, the upper stage must separate from the booster around 75 kilometers up and complete several orbital burns with its six Raptor engines. A true orbital flight could happen in 2026, followed by the toughest part, surviving re-entry and landing safely back at Starbase. Another key milestone will be in-orbit refueling, one starship transferring cryogenic methane and oxygen to another. That capability is essential for deep space missions like Artemis 3, and SpaceX aims to test it next year. To meet its aggressive starship timeline, SpaceX must overcome all these key engineering, operational, and regulatory hurdles. The bottom line is that there's still a lot of work to be done. SpaceX remains, by far, the most capable space company in the solar system, but assembling all the pieces needed for a successful lunar landing will take time. SpaceX has stated that it can meet a 2028 timeline for Starship's readiness to carry Artemis astronauts to the moon, which now aligns with NASA's updated schedule for Artemis 3. Still, this is spaceflight. Nothing is ever guaranteed. So once again, the question stands. What more can SpaceX do? One big way SpaceX could speed things up is by cranking out reliable hardware even faster. To really boost their launch cadence, they need to scale up production of super heavy boosters and starships so that new vehicles are rolling off the line constantly. That means a solid, high-efficiency manufacturing setup for engines and airframes that can keep up with demand. They're already making serious moves in that direction. The new Star Factory in Boca Chica is a huge deal. It's built to drastically cut down construction time. The upgraded mega bays now have rotating work platforms and welding robots to keep the process humming along. And there's a new gigabay on the way to make things even faster. Actually, make that two gigabays and another star factory in Florida, basically doubling production capacity. On top of that, SpaceX is building four launch pads in parallel, Pad B in Boca Chica, one at LC-39A, and two more at SLC-37 in Florida. They're even putting together a horizontal transport barge to move Starship and Super Heavy stages between Texas and Florida, before all the new factories are even online. Testing is another huge factor. The faster you can test, the faster you can develop. 
Expanding the McGregor engine test facility would let them run more Raptor engines in parallel, especially the newer Raptor 3s. I'm not sure how far along they are with that, but more test stands and more trained staff could really shave months off development. The Hawthorne facility might also need to grow. Raptor production doesn't seem like a bottleneck right now, but if the pace keeps accelerating, it could become one. Then there's the people side of things. SpaceX needs a ton of highly skilled engineers, welders, and technicians. And it's not easy to find that many folks with such niche skills. They could totally open their own training academy, bringing in new graduates and training them up internally. They're already upgrading the Massey's test site after the Ship 36 incident, but adding another test pad there could be smart. Two ship static fire spots would mean one could be offline for maintenance without slowing down the schedule. And imagine if they could static fire boosters somewhere other than the main launch site. It would free up the pad for launches. You'd need a big flame trench, sure, but not quite on the same scale as a full launch pad. Maybe they could build it next to Massey's, on that same stretch of highway. Even the little logistic stuff adds up. A new road from the build site to the launch site could make life easier. Close it off for rocket moves without the constant beach access drama. And keep staff traffic flowing during long rollouts. A storage bay closer to the pad would help too, somewhere to park big gear or even a starship while waiting for its turn. And honestly, life at Starbase itself could use some upgrades. They're already adding apartments and a gym, but more creature comforts would go a long way, like a pizza place that cranks out lunch for hundreds of people, a few more cafes, or a shuttle bus running between sites every 15 minutes. If more staff could live on site instead of commuting from Brownsville, it'd probably make operations smoother. On the more routine side of things, SpaceX also has to keep the paperwork flowing as smoothly as the rockets. Getting and maintaining launch licenses is a huge part of keeping their schedule on track. Every new version of Starship needs approval from the FAA. And if those licenses get held up, the whole test program grinds to a halt. A stable, predictable regulatory process would make a massive difference in keeping launches coming one after another. Then there's the environmental side of the equation. Starbase in Texas has been under close watch for its environmental impact. Things like debris, rocket exhaust, and noise all draw scrutiny from federal regulators. SpaceX has to stay on top of those issues and work closely with the agencies involved to keep operations moving smoothly. The faster they can address those concerns, the less likely it is that environmental reviews will stall their progress. At the end of the day, it's hard to imagine SpaceX going even faster. They're already working at an insane pace, building new factories, new pads, and testing nonstop. But knowing SpaceX, if there's a way to shave even a few more days off the schedule, they'll find it. I believe Starship will eventually be able to send humans to the moon and back, maybe even do it solo. But with Sean Duffy's public insistence that he won't let China beat the U.S. back to the moon, it makes sense to have an alternative plan just in case. One idea floating around is a shorter version of Starship that might make lunar missions easier. Two of the biggest challenges with the current Starship design are how many refuelings it needs and its height, which makes landing on uneven terrain tricky. NASA doesn't actually need Starship's massive ability to land 100 to 200 tons on the moon. That's way more than what the Lunar Lander mission requires. The key point is that the Starship HLS probably shouldn't handle its own translunar injection TLI burn. That burn needs the lander to carry a ton of propellant, roughly 20 to 25 tons worth of extra tanks and structure that only get used once during the mission. After the TLI burn, all that extra weight becomes dead weight, making the lunar descent, ascent, and return less efficient at every step. So, what if the lander was shorter and lighter because it didn't have to do its own TLI? Instead, it would launch into low Earth orbit and dock with a separate translunar tug or depot, which would handle the TLI burn. By cutting out the tanks and hardware for the TLI, the lander's dry mass drops significantly, and that brings some serious advantages. The vehicle would be shorter with a lower center of gravity, making landings more stable and simplifying things like the crew elevator. It would have more delta-v margin for the round trip between the near-rectilinear halo orbit, NRHO, and the lunar surface, which means more flexibility and room for error. Most importantly, this design cuts down the amount of propellant needed for each mission, which means fewer tanker launches to refuel it in orbit. That simplifies the whole operation and lowers costs. Of course, this is still a rough idea. It would mean building a new version of Starship and tweaking the mission profile a bit, and it's not clear if NASA would be okay with that. Plus, Elon Musk always wants his Starship spacecraft to be bigger, 
taller and more powerful. So I'm not sure if he'd be on board either. So NASA's current plan isn't to just swap out SpaceX's Starship right away. It's more like a race between SpaceX and Blue Origin. Whoever gets their lunar lander ready first for Artemis 3 will probably get the mission. Blue Origin's lander is pretty different from Starship. It's about 16 meters tall, but designed to fit into the 7 meter payload bay of their new Glenn rocket, which, fun fact, still isn't flying yet. This lander can carry around 20 metric tons down to the moon and is reusable, or it can carry up to 30 tons if it stays on the lunar surface. It runs on liquid hydrogen and oxygen, but unlike Starship, these fuel tanks are in the upper half and the crew cabin sits at the bottom. What's interesting is that Blue Origin isn't doing this solo. They're teaming up with companies like Lockheed Martin, which is working on an orbital refueling vehicle. Other partners are handling stuff like docking, navigation, and unloading cargo. For now, the human landing system has one main job, getting astronauts to and from the moon safely. The first missions will focus on that simple goal, providing transportation and a temporary home for the few days crews spend on the lunar surface. It'll give them a safe place to live, work, and stay protected from radiation while they carry out their science missions. As things progress, the HLS will take on a bigger role. NASA's already looking ahead to longer stays on the moon and even the first steps toward building a permanent presence there. That means a lot of gear and materials will need to make the trip from Earth. Everything from early habitat structures to mining and resource processing equipment that could one day help astronauts live off the land. But it's not all smooth sailing. Developing these landers is tough because they're using a lot of new, unproven tech to meet NASA's demands. That means delays and changes can happen. SpaceX has already faced some of this. The GAO pointed out that most of the critical tech these contractors need isn't fully ready yet. Out of 11 important technologies, only four are considered mature. The real challenge, though, is when it's time to actually use these landers on missions with people aboard. There won't be a ton of real-world testing before astronauts rely on them during the riskiest parts of the trip. So NASA has to juggle moving fast with making sure everything's safe and reliable, which is way easier said than done.